Are you awake out there? Bo, are you awake still? All right, just making sure. They were struggling this morning. I seen them up there stretching and yawning. And I'm like, oh, I got my hands full today. Today is the effort to keep Bo awake. Right, Bo? We'll try our best, buddy. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with you. It's good to be among fellow believers uh, and also ones that are willing to just let God just take over this morning. This past week, I had a the privilege. I was invited over to Pamela's house. Uh, and it so happened it was Monday. And what happened on Monday? It was July 4th, right? So Pamela uh, invited uh, my family over. We had a good time of fellowship together. We had a great meal. Then we went down to the football field and got some ice cream. Best ice cream I ever had. You know why? Because it was free for one. And the year actually, they had three choices of ice cream, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. And they had, they thought that they would ask me which one I wanted. What do you think I spent? All three, right? You have to have a variety in your life, right? So we had ice cream. Then we come back and we watched a good uh, a good uh, firework display in Tribune. And as I was sitting there and as I was uh, thinking and seeing all these great colors in the sky, well, it started to make me think about and imagine. You ever see something time and time again, but you never think, how does that happen, right? How do they get all those colors and different colors that exist and those fireworks and get them up there in the sky and have them explode and all this stuff? And it made me start to wonder, and I found myself thinking, how do they get all these different explosions to happen, right? And where do you think I went to? But I went to Mr. Google. Sorry, guys, I don't go to Siri. I go to Mr. Google, right? And I found a little clip that I want to share with you a little bit, right, on how these things happen. You, you guys ready back here? You got a clip for me? Maybe? Possibly? No? Maybe? Possibly? So we're putting them on the spot today. We're making them work. Here we go. What makes clip? fireworks colorful? Good question. Let's start with a simple white firework. This is an example of incandescence. Think of an incandescent light bulb. When something gets really hot, its atoms vibrate around, smash into each other, and release energy in the form of light. As it heats up, it goes from red to orange to yellow to white. That gives us bright white fireworks and sparklers. They're just flecks of really hot metal. But incandescence is hard to control to get specific colors. For that, you need luminescence. Yellow firework is yellow because of luminescing sodium, the same stuff that's in good old table salt. If you take a little bit of salt and put it in the flame of a Bunsen burner, it shines a bright yellow. Heat makes the sodium's electrons get excited in a very particular way. They jump from a low energy state to a high energy state. And when they fall back down, they release a photon, a little packet of light. Because of the particular architecture of a sodium atom, it gives off mostly yellow light, so it's used in yellow fireworks. Other elements give off different sets of colors. Strontium, which used to be used in TV screens, gives us red. Calcium, the stuff in our bones, has greens, yellows, and reds that combine to a strong orange. Barium, the stuff you swallow so you can x-ray your PI tract, gives us green. They used to use a great chemical for blue, but they decided it wasn't a good idea to fill the air with arsenic, so now they go with copper instead. These chemicals go into fireworks as boring powders, but light the fuse and... All right, that's our clip. So, first of all, did you guys even know this stuff? Seriously. I mean, chemistry class would have been so much better, right? If we would have made those explosions happen, right? But you look at these and understand that these things come together 
and they they create this kind of explosion, right? Uh, the, and, and it just fills the area with not just a pal, but a, a, with the color as well. But another thing that, that you need to understand is that with an explosion, it becomes dangerous, doesn't it? I mean, you think about it. When they put on these displays at different towns, they actually have people licensed to do this, right? They, they go through the classes to understand the importance of how to do it safely. They also always have the fire department at hand just in case something goes wrong, right? Well, as much as we think that it is some kind of dangerous, I will tell you, as we sit in a Pamela's house, there are some that do personal shows that they have no fear and they have no license to do it. I mean, her neighbor right across the road, was he was shooting out fireworks. They were landing in trees. They were landing on his roof. And I would tell you, at times, there's a projectile coming my way. Uh, I think some of us even moved our cars because it was getting way a little too close. But it made me understand that there is power in that firework. And I tell you all this because when we look at the scripture today, we're going to look at Luke chapter 6, 12 through 19. And we're going to look at a power that exists that we have in store for us. We need to respect the power. We need to acknowledge the power. We need to understand the importance of the power. The power I'm speaking of, of course, is the Holy Spirit himself, right? But uh, we're going to look at how Jesus himself and the power within him changed the lives of so many. So Luke chapter 6, if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 6, we're looking at verse 12 through 19 this morning. It says this. It says, one of those days... Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose, and chose 12 of them, who he also designated as apostles, Simon, who he had named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, or Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was also called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor, he called all these twelve together, right? And then in verse 17, he says, He went down with them and stood on the level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Ending there in verse 19. The thing that really focused on and, and, and really intrigued me was that last verse of 19 where it says, And the people all tried to touch him because power, let me say that again, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Now that caught my attention. The power was coming from Jesus. Power was coming from Jesus. And it caught my attention because I remember this isn't the only place that we see this power manifested uh, when Jesus was on this earth. I mean, you see it in all kinds of scripture that exist, but uh, the ones that I can think of, Luke chapter 5, verse 17, one day Jesus was teaching again. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come uh, from, a very, uh, from every village of Galilee and from Judea, Judea and Jerusalem. And it says here in that 17, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And then the one we're all familiar with is Luke chapter 8, where we read the story about a woman that had been bleeding, a subject of bleeding for how many years? But 12 years, and no one could heal her. And she came up behind Jesus, and, he and she touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. And Jesus said those words, words who touched me? Jesus asked, who touched me? And when all denied who touched him, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressuring, pressing against you. And Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power, again, power has gone out from me. The Gospel of Mark says, says it a little different about the same story. It says, Jesus realizing the power had gone out from him. And it says, when it says that realized the power had gone out from him, now I, I might be wrong with this, but 
to me when I hear those words, it's when Jesus healed this woman, it almost seems like if he was taken by surprise when she touched him. He wasn't ready to physically heal her, but something touched him and the power came from him. Now, I want you to hold that thought, though. We're going to come back to that the power that was released even as a surprise to Jesus today. Because I want us to get into our passage a little bit deeper today and look where God is leading us. So the first thing I want us to notice in this passage is there was a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, Tyre, and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed. People came to Jesus. People came to Jesus because they wanted to touch him. They wanted him to touch them. They wanted the power to come out from Jesus to change their lives. And I say this because, listen to me when I say it, this is why many of us are here today in church. This is not a ritual, religious ritual, that we go through step by step. Yes, we sing. Yes, we pray. Yes, we listen to a sermon. But the real reason that we should be here today is to be touched by Jesus. That is the real ideal reason why we come to church. At least I, I pray daily that is why we come. That is why each of us are here today, that we may be touched by Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I've already felt the touch of Jesus even through the sharing of our youth today. To understand that they felt the touch of Jesus when they were away and come back and share with us, that makes us understand the importance of why we want touched by Jesus. Janae says she's a crier, but I think that's an emotion that God gives her. That's a gift from God. That she can feel the passion and the understanding and that she wants to share that. And maybe it is through tears, but we love it just the same. Amen? Wow, got an amen. That sounds good. In fact, that's why individuals become Christians, folks. Because we want to be touched by Jesus. We want to feel his healing hand of mercy. We want to hear his passion for us. Personally, I can look at it myself. I came to Jesus so his power could change me. And so that I would have his power to overcome all the difficulties in my life. Listen, when Jesus really touches us, I want you to remember he fixes us inside. He changes who we are. He cleans up what we've fouled up or messed up. And he fixes what we've broken in our lives. And folks, that is why we should come here today. And I say this because if we do this church thing right, then we can lay hold of the power of Jesus that he's willing to provide today. The power of his Holy Spirit. So again, the first thing that I've seen was, uh, I want us to accept this morning is the touch of Jesus and how he wants to give us God's power. Now, the next thing I want us to notice in this passage is found in that verse 19, and it says, the power came out from him and healed them all. Did you hear what I just said? Where did the power come from? The power came from Jesus. My point is this this morning. If we want God's power in our lives, then we need to get it from Jesus. We can't do it ourselves, folks. Too many people, even Christians, believe they, they have enough sufficient power in their lives to handle whatever's coming their way. And so they don't bother to have Jesus touch their lives. But listen to me when I say this. This is simply not true. We need the power of Jesus. We don't have enough power, nor will we ever have enough power. We must understand this morning that the power of Jesus and its importance in our lives. Now, I sat and I tried to contemplate how could I visually give you an illustration to help you with this. So 
So I don't have it visual, but I want you to just bear with me this morning and think of it this way. I want you to imagine that I pull up a sweeper today and I have it here in front. And as I look at the sweeper, I'm telling you how much power it has to suck the dirt out from our, our, our carpet and our stage and, and how it can clean this church from top to bottom without an issue. And after I explain that, I take the, the little power switch and I turn it on and nothing happens. And I mess with that switch time and time again, and nothing happens. And I look at you and say, now why isn't this sweeper working? And your answer would be, because it's not plugged in. Oh, that makes a little more sense, doesn't it? So I unwrap that cord, and I take that cord, and I hand it off to my wife, Tammy, because I know she's so exciting, right? And I give it to Tammy and I come back up here and I switch and I switch and I switch and no power yet. And why isn't it working? Because Tammy doesn't have the power to make this thing run. It has to be plugged into a receptacle, doesn't it? It has to have the power that exists. And when we plug it there, then we have power. Then we have the ability to be clean and use it for cleaning. And that's why I'm trying to look at this and say this illustration is the same thing as your life. How do you get the power you need? You need to be plugged into Jesus' power. Amen? That's where you need to be. It needs to be in his receptacle. It needs to be in his time. I searched all through the Bible, and this one really hit home. Romans 8, 11, it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in where? You. God's power comes to me. It comes to you through the spirit of God, folks. That's the power we're speaking of this morning. When we become a Christian, when we accept Jesus as a personal savior, God makes the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to live inside of you. He gives it to each and every one of, them, of, of us. God's power comes to me through the Spirit of God. God's power comes to you through the Spirit of God. And we got to remember that. The presence of the Spirit inside you is what gives you the power Jesus died to make sure that you had in the first place. Jeremy Camp sings a song. It's titled, Same Power. Listen to this chorus. It says, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. He goes on and says, the same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm the raging sea, lives in us. It lives in us. So, folks, we need to understand where this power comes from. Our God can do all kinds of things for us because of this power that he gets through this Holy Spirit that he puts inside us. And God, as Ephesians 3.20 teaches us, can do far more abundantly than we all could ever ask or think of. That's what God's power can do for each of us. But some possibly may ask, but pastor, what happens if he doesn't? What if God doesn't give me everything I ask or think of that I need? And see, that's where we go back to the beginning of our sermon today, our message. Remember how I said it seemed that Jesus was surprised when the woman touched him and the power went out from him. Now, it just may be my own speculation here, but the way I read this, it just seems that when the woman touched Jesus, she was healed even though Jesus didn't realize that it happened. And so it's only natural for us that we would ask, how could that be? How could she be healed if Jesus didn't even know she was there? And the answer, of course, God always provides an answer, is later in that chapter 8 in Luke and at verse 48, when it says, then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace. Listen, Jesus didn't need to know she touched him because the contact that she made that brought her her healing was based on a contract that God had made. 
When I speak of this contract, I speak of the contract that our faith in him turns on the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to plug anything into it, but the power is still there. And you see, the power is there because the electrical, uh, because if you think about it, it's the same as electrical company has a contract with us. So that anytime we plug anything into the socket, the juice is already there. The electric company doesn't need to know what you're plugging in. They just give you the contract to say the power will be there when you plug it in. In that same concept, our faith does the same thing. God has provided the power of the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't need to know what you're plugging into it. He just wants to make sure that you're plugging into it. Because that's the power you need. Folks, whenever you come into a faith, you plug into his power. His power is there, and it's there all the time. But we must be willing to use it. We must allow it to flow within us and guide us and correct us. You see, it's not Jesus' fault that we don't get what we need. Folks, it's ours. Think of it this way. If we would have had a bad thunderstorm, thunderstorm comes in and actually comes through the cable or whatever, and it, it impacts my TV, it hits my TV. Now, after that electrical storm, that TV costly, no matter what, it's glitching, it's not working right over in the, the parsonage over to my home. And I say, man, okay, so I know what I need to do. I need to bring that TV over here to the church. What would happen if I plug that TV into this church instead of my home? There'd still be some issues. What the TV still wouldn't work correctly. Why? Because the electricity is not the problem. The TV is the problem. And I say this because when we look at our lives, we need to understand whether we are allowing that Holy Spirit to overflow, allowing that Spirit to flow through us with every step that we do. It's not the electrical company's fault. It's the TV set fault. It's the same thing in our lives. If we look at our spiritual lives, we can relate this example just the same. When we don't get all we need or think we need, the problem isn't God. There's something wrong with us. Sometimes the problem is our faith. We get this idea that even though I ask, I don't really believe we'll do anything about it. Sometimes the problem is with our lives. We have sin in our lives that we're trying to cover up, believing that God won't know. It's hidden deep, dark in the closet that we create. And sometimes what we're asking for would just hurt us in our witness instead of benefiting his kingdom. I mean, just because we think it's a good idea doesn't mean it's always the right idea. There's one more thing that tends to rob us from God's power, and it's listed here in our scripture this morning. If you look at that verse 12, it says, Jesus went up to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. The problem for many of us is that we don't receive what God uh, wants to give us because we don't ask. Jesus has power because he prayed, folks. He prayed. You see, many times we get this confused. We think, well, he's God, right? He's part of the Trinity, right? And so his power exists on this earth because he is God. But we can't deny the fact what we see scripture of Philippians 2 that says, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for, for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing, folks, by taking the very nature of his servant being made in human likeness. Listen, it's not like Jesus simply took his name to write God off his executive desk, and he came to earth. Philippians is telling us that Jesus literally removed himself, become mortal, just like us. And because of that, he understood that in order to have the power that he needed to perform the miracles and the healings, Jesus needed his Father. He needed to pray. Think about it. Jesus did it a lot. 
He prayed before killing the crowd. He prayed before he fed the 5,000 people. He, he prayed before killing the man who was deaf and mute. He prayed before bring, uh, bringing the dead back to life. Folks, he prayed every time he needed to do anything that needed power. He needed his father to supply. Listen, a lot of times we don't have the power of God in our lives because we don't spend any time in prayer. And let's not get intimidated and, and, and think that God prayed all night. I can't do that. It doesn't matter how much time you put in. Maybe two minutes, maybe three hours, whatever it is, then put that time to God. Listen to me. God isn't looking down at us with a stopwatch in his hand saying, well, they didn't give me that extra five minutes, so they're not getting anything. That's not how God works, does he? He wants us to talk with him. So pray, because prayer plugs us into the power of God. Listen. Listen. Let me give you one more thought before it close. If I get all theological on you, right? The Greek word for power in our text is actually dynamis. Now, of course, most of us don't speak Greek, do we? But there is an English word that is derived from that Greek word dynamis. Does anyone know what it is? It's dynamite. It's dynamite. Think about it. The folks who invented these explosive sticks, these fireworks, used the word dynamite describe their invention. Maybe, maybe it was because they understood that God's power in the explosion it has in their life. If you can imagine the power of God, then you have a good idea of the kind of power God has placed inside you this morning. So the question becomes, say this to us for those that have not made commitment. If, if you never had that step of faith, and you never started that relationship with God, and you said, Jesus is your personal Savior, then I want you to understand that this power is laying dormant inside you right now. It is dormant. It's not active. You haven't plugged into it. It's there. God is willing challenge to you is, is there anything holding back the power of God? Because let's face it, we get through. My son Colton just has a new puppy. It's, it's, it's as big as a, a golf ball, but it's only six months. And he's got legs coming out there. And he just reminds me of the fact that we are so clumsy in our own life. And all we have to do is plug in Let's get past our own pride. Let's get past our own uh, willingness to say, well, I have control of this and say, God, take control of this. The question and the challenge is, are you allowing this power to make a difference in your life? Are you allowing it to, to shine? That's where God wants us to be. I asked the praise team to come forward as we sing our last song. I want to leave you with this concept. This is always an invitation to so this altar that's always open, but remember, it's our ability to make the choice to get out of the way and let God just take control. 
know what I want out of this church. I want to spend all one day get up and do this church dance. <laughs> Maybe. They were huffing and puffing. Huh? They were huffing and puffing afterwards. Were they? The kids were huffing and puffing, so we got some energy that we need, right? So let's call upon God for that energy today. Amen? Let's let give God the glory and let's just celebrate his power within us. Are you with me today? Stand with me if you would. If God's calling you, I encourage you to take that step of faith today. Let's pray. Go ahead.